Our special guest for this episode is Chris Tavani. Chris is a teacher, writer, and instructional coach. She's nationally known for her expertise on reading across the curriculum, content comprehension, assessment, and planning. That last part is important because Chris joined us to talk about planning. Welcome, I'm Dave. I'm John. And this is Teaching Like Ted Lasso. Warning, we expect that you've watched Ted Lasso. There will be spoilers ahead and scenes that don't make sense if you don't have some familiarity with the show. Chris Tavani is our guest on Teaching Like Ted Lasso. I was trying to remember when we first met, and then I remembered that I had a book that you signed, uh, Do I Really Have to Teach Reading? And it says 2008. That was at the, I believe, the Michigan Reading Association mm -hmm. Conference. And I was there, John Golden, uh, actually the co-host of this podcast and I, we're both really interested in the comprehension strategies. And that's kind of why we were we were thinking about how might that look in math class. And I went to your session and you were actually, you talked a little bit about that, but you were talking about the role of planning and teaching and in particular the workshop model. And so when John and I decided to do a planning episode for Teaching Like Ted Lasso, you immediately came to mind. So Chris, welcome to Teaching Like Ted Lasso. This stroll down memory lane does not do justice to everything that you do. So would you mind sharing with our audience who you are and what it is you do? Well, thank you, David, for having me. It's so nice to be here. And I just love that idea of going out of your math circle to just see, see learning from a different perspective. That's so smart. Well, I started off as an elementary school teacher and thought really, would this, would this comprehension work help older students who could read words but couldn't comprehend text? And so that journey led me to teaching in high schools and working with English language learners, working with kids living in extreme poverty, just trying to figure out, okay, okay, how do we support their needs? My, my latest adventure, I've taught every grade, but seventh and eighth grade on Tuesdays and Thursdays when I'm in town, I am working in a middle school in Denver with some striving readers. And oh my goodness, it's really, it's been great. It's, it's really hard. It's kicking my butt, but it's just, it's keeping me learning and trying to figure out, okay, what do these guys need? I mean, they're, they're so different than high school kids. And as you well know, so that's what I'm doing now in, in, in conjunction with some consulting, but just trying to figure out, okay, what does this teaching look like with boots on, you know, boots on the ground with real people? I love that, that term striving readers too, is that, that's such a powerful way to think about uh, our learners. I, I think I stole that from my um, elementary colleagues and, and, you know, as opposed to struggling, that striving, this is, I think it's more hopeful, yeah. um, right? That there's, that they're not done yet and we're going to help them get better. I know that you're familiar with Ted Lasso. How did you get familiar with Ted Lasso? <laughs> well, I am a huge sports fan. I still like the Broncos, even though they're just terrible. And I had a friend who is not a sports fan. She, she kept recommending, oh, you got to see Ted Lasso. You got to see Ted Lasso. And I just was like, mm, I don't really want to, I'm really not into soccer. I really don't want to watch it. Well, I think one afternoon I was just kind of flipping through and thought, all right, I'll watch one. And then of course you see the first episode and you just can't stop. And so I was thankful that a couple seasons had gone by so I could just keep watching them because they were just so good. And my face kind of hurt at the end of every episode just from smiling because it was just such a, you know, it came out of such a timely period in our lives with COVID that uh, it just was hopeful. And so I, 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 I rewatched episodes every once in a while just to kind of reground myself. One of the things that we try to do like Ted <laughs> is ask a silly question to get to know our guests. And this uh, for this theme, we're asking, what song would you sing for karaoke and why? <laughs> do you do karaoke? There's only one song. I've... No, I have a terrible voice. I am a good audience member. Uh, but the, uh, but I have done it once. And uh, the only time I've ever done it, I did the song, um, Tina Turner's song, Rolling on a River. And I think it was just because I could do the hand motions at the beginning, which distracted people from my actual horrid voice and then I went you know when we were thinking about these questions just that idea of like just going with it just going with the flow right right because I think as teachers we got to improv we as teachers we have to improv because we never know what we're going to get hit with 
<laughs> yeah, I was thinking I've only done it once as well. And I did, I've got you, babe. So first of all, it was a duet. So I didn't have to carry the whole thing. And then it was interesting. I was just re-watching some of season two. Headspace starts with I've Got You, Babe, the one where Roy is a little clingy with Keely. And so I thought that that was a nice little connection. That... Yeah. So one of the things that I found interesting as I was going back and reading some of your stuff is, and this actually came out of a, a foreword that you wrote for that workshop book. I'm going to read it here. I've learned that athletics and teaching have a lot in common. Wasn't it Yogi Berra who said, if you don't know where you are headed, you might not get there? Was he talking about baseball or unit design? In athletics, the best players have coaches who inspire, instruct, and encourage. It makes sense the teachers should have good coaching as well. And again, what's interesting is our very last theme was on coaching. And so it seems like a nice sort of connection that we're going from coaching to planning. So what is it that you see in terms of this relationship between what do you wish, I guess, more teachers understood about planning? Well, it was interesting because that foreword that I wrote was for my instructional coach. And I was pretty good at getting kids to do things for me because they liked me, but there were always a few who just you know, they liked me, but what I was asking them to do, they weren't going to do anyway. And she, Sam Bennett, really helped me to see, okay, Chris, you just can't plan day to day. You've got to plan for several weeks. And I was always really against that because I thought, okay, well, what if I do all this planning and then it doesn't meet the needs of the kids? I just thought it was a time waster. But what she helped me to see was if I know where I'm going, just like that Yogi Berra quote, if I know where I'm going, those detours that sometimes happen like fire drills or a kid being gone for three weeks and then comes back. If I've got a long-term plan, I can get back on course more easily. And what I've started doing a lot is planning like six to eight week units. And really my planning is just two pages. I'm just trying to think about, okay, why does it matter that, you know, how does, how does the standard fit in with what's happening in the world outside of school? Why is it worthy of kids' time? What could kids make or do to show me that they're hitting the standards? And then possible text to meet different reading levels in there. So as a language arts teacher, what, what, what's some literature, what's some poetry, but then what's also some nonfiction that would support the themes? So my long-term plan now is really not very fancy, but it's sort of giving me that roadmap. So the day-to-day -day planning is a little bit easier. Before I was thinking about, I think when, when you saw me in 2008 and when I wrote, do I really have to teach reading? I was just thinking about, all right, every day I'm going to model a thinking strategy for kids and then I'm going to give them text to practice. The red thread were these strategies, but I don't think it was as rich as having kids like study a topic. But I think that's the new piece that I've added was this topic. Because when I was just doing reading strategies every day, I was kind of thinking about, okay, what are the kids going to read now? I'd find myself rushing to the copy machine and it was just burning me out. And so that long-term planning really helped me just sort of think about, all right, you know, what's some real work that kids could actually do that they could share with an audience bigger than just me, because I think that would give them some more urgency to actually go back in and do that hard, you know, the hard work of reading and writing and thinking. I can't remember. I don't know if it was you or if it was Debbie Miller, or if it was, again, we went to a lot of conference uh, sessions that you all did, but it was like, you, you wanted to be careful that you didn't fall into the trap of doing these comprehension strategies and missing the bigger picture of, we want them to be able to under, understand what they're reading. Yeah. You've got yeah. all these sticky notes. <laughs> now what? Right. Yeah. I, I actually, I think it was a student teacher who asked me that, who said, Okay, they got all these sticky notes, now what? And it's such a great question. You know, what are you gonna do with all this thinking that you've held? Um, are you gonna are you gonna write a, a, a an open letter that you're gonna send to somebody to create awareness? Or um, you know, are you gonna do a two minute soapbox speech to share about this new issue that's you know, something something that is found in the world outside of school, I think is gives kids more reasons to actually do the work. That's my big goal right now, is giving them lots of reasons to dig back in. Because I think things are different since COVID. Teaching was always hard, but it's a, it's a different kind of hard now. 
So one of the things that you've talked about, and you talked about it in, do I really have to teach reading? And you mentioned it here, Chris, was this idea of sort of assessing, right? Are we making progress to these long-term goals? So so what what are some of the ways that you plan for assessment or, or that assessment supports planning? Well, I think I had to probably hear this 15 t- different times, but but I, I think of that big idea is that we're not teaching standards. We want kids to hit the standards. Mm-hmm. And that was a big aha for me. And I started thinking about, all right, when I dig into those, to, to any standard, they're so juicy. A chapter test is not going to be rich enough to really give kids an opportunity to demonstrate that they're hitting those standards. So I, I started to think, all right, what could kids make? or do or produce like i I guess sort of like expeditionary learning a performance a demonstration of of understanding like what could they do to show me that they've met that that goal and so when i think about okay what i want what standards i want kids to hit and then i try to think about all right what are they going to make or create and then can i create all those standards in a compelling topic that's you know connected to you know as opposed to teaching the carbon cycle Could we look at these horrible wildfires that we're having in Colorado and how does that connect? And well, actually they're all over the country now. And okay, what does that connect to? Does it connect to climate change? Does it connect to the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, human made problems that we've created? And so it gives some controversy, I think, for kids to kind of argue, which is always a big standard, but then also it gives them a reason. I think it provokes them to read to write, to discuss, and try to kind of think about, all right, where do I stand in this on this issue or this position? It's n- interesting that you're talking about the whole role of the test at the end of the chapter. My students and I were just talking about this. If you're just cramming it for the exam, you're really not learning it, understanding it, and like you were saying, going to be able to apply it outside of the outside of the classroom. And so as we're thinking about the ways that we can gather data, which is, I think that's the way that, that I've tried to communicate to them what assessment is, it's the gathering of data. We need to think about a, a, a greater range of approaches. And I like what you're saying in terms of this, this that they are, it's, it's the action of it, right? The, and sometimes that feels maybe, and it's always easier to look on the outside and say, oh, English has it easy. English language arts has it easy because they're writing and they're, you know, making speech. You know, what does that look like in mathematics? But it can look the same in mathematics. Yeah, I think like using math uh, to solve problems or to make right proposals. It's like taking that skill. And, you know, and I, I was thinking as you were talking, I was thinking that, you know, I still do to give little quizzes. Like I'll give like, well, for example, reading checks along the way, but I'm not giving tests that are like, you know, what sh- color shirt did the main character have? I'm trying to find out like who's reading, who's not reading, why aren't they reading? What do they need? Who's reading and not getting it? How do I support them? So my quizzes or my tests seem to be more in the middle of the unit to see if they're getting the information. So then they can have that information to, to work on whatever bigger product or authentic make at the end that they're going to use to demonstrate that they're hitting those standards. It's kind of switched, whereas the quiz, you know, the ch- the chapter test was like the big end. Well, it's like, okay, no, 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 no. I want you to read this novel because it's got great story in it and story is going to be what makes people care about the issue. And so, you know, you, you can use, you know, this narrative model to help you share what you're figuring out and, you know, whatever it is we're studying. Yeah. And so now it sounds like the, that purpose again is to give you, it's, it's to give you information that can allow you to make the adjustments that are necessary. Yeah, to just kind of, yeah, see. And I think part of that is like catching kids before it's too late. So, you know, as a math student, and I always think about chemistry, it was, I would always just think, oh God, if I could just get through this chapter, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll sit next to my best friend, Jeanette, who became a doctor and I'll copy off of her and I'll get through chapter three and then I'll figure out what I'm going to do chapter four. And it was just sort of the survival mode. The long story of that is that I never got, I was never very good at math. And so I lost power in the world. I have to pay people to do my taxes because I don't have that confidence. And, and so I think that's that other piece of catching people before it's too late and then reteaching to build that confidence. I think that's the thing with Ted Lasso is, 
is how he built confidence. I don't want to get corny, but how he built trust and confidence in his organization and in his players and people who then became his friends. And I think that's just so important that that as teachers, we we think about that that aspect of our teaching, not I gotcha and you're wrong and too bad you fail, but okay, what do you need? How can I help you next? Well, and that was one of those things that I remembered from your session at Michigan Reading Association was the catch and release. And again, I know that this was more in the single lessons, but you talked about using assessment to do that. As students were working, you were going around and gathering data about what they were doing, how they were doing it. And then you'd bring them all together and, and talk about it and then release them back in. And so, so that they can continue to be making progress as opposed to floundering. Like, like they just quit. They, and so, you know, if a kid quits or stops coming to class or quits trying, then, then as the teacher, I'm sunk. And so what's the next thing you need to just keep trying? What's the next little support or piece that, that I can provide you to keep on going with this work? I think it was Grant Wiggins who used to talk about assessment as giving students information that can allow them to continue to be successful. He was a cross-country coach. Coaching comes up again. He was a cross-country mm -hmm. coach and he had a particular runner who was never going to win a race. And he wasn't quite sure why the, this runner continued to be on the team. They were always coming in last. And the runner responded that every race, they got better. Their time was going down and their weight was going down. And that's all that they were paying attention to. Grant's big picture was winning. That wasn't the great, the big picture of the runner. And so by asking that, and then he began recognizing, wow, that same thing can happen in classrooms. If we can, if it's not, about getting 100%, but it's about students being able to see that they're making progress. To your point about math and, and chemistry, I was just listening to someone talk on a podcast about math anxiety. And a lot of times math anxiety comes about because of the stories we tell, the stories we tell ourselves. And we go back and we look at, oh, here's a place where I failed. And so here's a similar situation and I'm going to fail again. If instead we can give experiences to students, plan experience to students where they can have success, where they can make progress, that changes the stories that they tell. And I think that, again, that's one of the things that I loved about Ted Lasso, especially the the writing to begin with it was it was it was a three act structure and the middle was a mess. Brene Brown talks about that me messy middle. The middles, the second one, all of these things were going on, but they all kept trying. And again, this idea of resilience. Yeah, and I think that um, it's this artificial time limit that we we impose on ourselves and on our kids. And and I think for me, it was always just like, okay, well. You know, I've got to, I've got to master this by the chapter test on Friday. And if I don't, too bad, they're moving on. And then, you know, as I started working with content area teachers, there was that same sort of feeling. Well, I've got all this content to cover. If they don't get it too bad, we got to move on. And learning just doesn't work that way. There is that messy middle. And if we can languish in that messy middle a little bit, that's where the learning really is happening. I'm like, oh, you're so close. You're so close. Okay, let me show you this little thing. Now go back and try it. And, and it moves us through that part. But if we just say, okay, too bad, you're done, you didn't get it, and move on. And I know maybe people listening to this are thinking, well, I, you know, I have administrators that need me to move faster, and I have tests that are coming up, and I know there are all these pressures, right? And so, like, I think for me, I have to, I have to step back and think about, okay, who is this work really for? Like, I, I'm not doing this work for the principal, and I'm not doing it for the state. I'm doing it for those kids right in front of me to figure out how to help them become, you know, better readers, writers, and thinkers. And you did it with kids to help them be better mathematicians because it gives them power in the world. And to the point, so again, Ted's not about wins and losses, and yet the the wins start piling up because of, <laughs> like you said, building relationship, trust. You know, they they began working together. When I talk to teachers and and they have the same concerns, Chris, about, well, wait, I've got so much content to cover. 
I try to, and, and this actually, I think, goes back to some of the comprehension strategy stuff that John and I were so fascinated about, because in mathematics, they're similar. There's the process standards, now the common core um, mathematical practices. What we see is that too often students will look at a test and say, you didn't show me how to do this. I'm not even going to try. Right. Again, that's the story that they tell. And so so you're trying to cover content. And if you miss something and a student's not going to do it, are you really preparing them to be successful if, if, if that's what it is? If instead we slow down and give students opportunity to play and build confidence, then they encounter a problem that they're not necessarily necessarily prepared for, but they have some of the tools to be able to try to make sense of it and try to, to think about, well, what could I do? What answers don't make sense? What, what do problems like this usually entail? Those sorts of things. And so, so one of the things that you talked about in No More Telling is Teaching, Less Lecture, More Engaged Learning was sort of transitioning from teacher, teachers covering content to kids engaged in that messy middle work. How do you, and you talked about the planning. So how do you plan to make that transition? How do you help teachers? Again, this idea of a coach, how do, as a coach, do you help teachers to be able to start thinking about less me as a teacher, more them as the students? Elective teachers are really good at that. And well, athletic coaches, right? Terrible athletic coaches talk all practice. Their teams don't get any time to, to do, to do the work. And so Thinking about, you know, the best, the best coaches really use workshop model. They, they try to model something, teach something, and they send the players out to, to practice. And while well, the kids are practicing, they're assessing and they're still teaching, but they're not teaching the whole darn team. You know, they're, they're teaching small groups or they're teaching individuals. And so I think for me, workshop model is a system on how I'm going to plan my time, like for what kids are going to do. So in the olden days, I used to start with the mini lesson, what I was going to do. Um, now I'm starting with the work time. What are the kids going to work on? What are they going to read? What are they going to write? What are they going to talk about? And then I go back to that mini lesson. Okay, what can I model for them so that work time is more productive? Because if they're working a little bit, then I can pull a small group or I can work with an individual. This last book that I wrote, so I have to read this. Kids were like asking that, like, okay, you know, I'd go into classrooms where I was coaching and kids would say, okay, why are we doing this? Why do I have to read this? Started making me think about like, okay, are we giving kids enough reasons to work? Because if we take off the lecture and the covering of content and we say to kids, okay, now go work for 45 minutes, they're not going to do that. They've got to have reasons. Sometimes the reason is the product that they're going to make, that they're going to share with somebody else. Sometimes the reasons might be really compelling text. Maybe it's the task that they're working on for that day that they're going to share with a teammate. I'm just trying to think of all different reasons. And I talk about six of them in the book, four of which I stole from expeditionary learning. That idea of, do I have a compelling topic? Do I have targets that are going to help kids hit the standards? Do the tasks help them hit targets and are they worthy of time? And is the text really interesting? I added the time piece. Some kids need more time for part of it. That means something has to come off their plate. Other kids need less time. So I got to think about, all right, how am I going to enrich that student? And then the, the, the sixth T is this idea of tending. Like, okay, what do you need? Do you need a pencil? Oh, you forgot your book again? Great. I have an extra one. Maybe, oh, wow. You know, I noticed yesterday you didn't do very much work with sitting next to your best friend. I got a special spot for you to work over here today. So that idea of just kind of, thinking about those six T's in terms of planning beforehand, just a little bit of long-term planning beforehand. What, what different texts are they going to read? What's the topic? What targets am I going for? And then on the day-to-day -day stuff, I can be more fluid and, and address some of those impromptu things that come up that I haven't expected because I know, once again, go back to Yogi Berra, I know where I'm headed. I know, I know where I want to get to. And so I can kind of corral people back if I've got that long-term vision in mind. Are you fam familiar with Simon Sinek's work? Does that name? Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's where I keep coming back to the, you know, the power of why. And I think it's Norman Eng. Eng has done this thing called a one sentence lesson plan. 
that basically has the student will and then the what, the how, and the why. And it's all in one sentence, right? So again, back to your instead, instead of lots and lots, teacher, my teachers don't always have time to create a bit, but they can have a, at the end, this is what it is and what's your compelling why. And it's not because it's going to be on the test. It's hopefully not even just because it's going to be the project at the end, but, but how how do how are students going to use this in the future? How is this going to make them back to Ted Lasso? How is this going to make them better learners? My wife and I have taken that, and both of us are interested in human centered design. We're, we don't like just the idea that the student, the student will. We want specifics. Who are these students? Which I think gets back to your attending. What is it that they need? Because I think too often when we're planning, we're planning for hypothetical students. And the, the more we can really think about the students that are in our classrooms, the actual students who are in, in those seats, the more adapted to those students our lessons are going to be. Yes, that's so smart, right? Just anticipating who you might have, you know, who, who might come in angry, who might come in apathetic, who might come in as like the super student and what, what are we going to do? How are we, how are we prepared for, for those kids so they can keep learning? I think that's just so smart anticipating their need, you know, students needs as opposed to just kind of doing this blanket. Okay. All kids will blah, blah, blah. I think that's really smart. Well, it makes me think of there's a, a time in, I think it's in the third season of Ted Lasso. The following is a scene from season three, episode five. Slice them, slice them, cut them, mash them. I'm okay. Say one to your voice, please. Okay. Eat them. I'll class them, Sam. Thank you, coach. Roy's going through the locker room, sort of pumping up each individual player and saying exactly what that player needs. He's not making a big speech to everybody. He's he's connecting with every individual player and, and knows who that player is and therefore is giving the encouragement that they need to be able to be successful. Is there anything else, Chris, that you want to share, talk about, anything that I forgot to ask when it comes to planning? that either my students or the teachers that I work with would benefit from? You know, I had an epiphany last week. I was, I was working with a, a new teacher, pretty, I mean, she's had like four years and she is just, she's working so hard and just trying so hard. And she helped me understand, she helped me think about this idea of like teacher preparation versus teacher planning. And I thought, okay, wait, I, and I still need to think more about this, but like, I started thinking like, okay, I was always prepared. Like I always had the copies made. I always made sure the technology was working. I always had the kids sitting in groups or however I wanted them arranged. I was prepared with my content, but that was really different than when I started doing long-term planning. And I think that planning piece is thinking about those kids needs. Like, all right, what do you know, why are they going to care about, Romeo and Juliet. What am I going to do for the kid who isn't going to be able to read the actual text? When I started to plan, I started anticipating students' needs and thinking of those reasons for kids to engage, because we do, as you said, have a lot of competition out there. And so I think that's something that I really want to think more about, maybe do a little bit of, of just maybe just some writing for myself, but right, how's being prepared? Because I think most teachers are prepared versus being planned. Just there's mm -hmm. just a, the, a little bit of a nuance there. Yeah, that that's interesting. So one of the things that that I often wonder too, I was doing some professional development, and I felt pretty good at the end of the professional development about how it went. Uh, one of the teachers comes up to me and says. So how long did it take you to get ready for this? And I was like, again, very proud, not thinking through my answers. Hours. I, I just did this hour. And this was just an hour long PD. And the teacher's response was, I don't have time for that. And I'm like, oh. So the other thing that, that I wonder about this preparation and planning is how do we make it sustainable, right? And so what I'm wondering is to your bigger point, if I've got a long-term vision of what this is, I can look at what, what I need to do to prepare and then ask myself, is this juice worth the squeeze to be able to get to where we need to go? Yeah, it's got to, and that's so, it's got to be sustainable, right? So are we 
Are we focusing on the right things? Is it the activity? Keep kids busy and engaged. Well, they're not even really necessarily engaged, but maybe entertained. Or is it real work? Like, I think for me, I, I you know, it's that it's Chick sent me high who talks about flow. Like mm -hmm. when I'm in the flow, time flies. When I'm doing real work that matters to me and to people I care about, I don't mind doing hard stuff. It's, it's when I don't see a purpose or I don't have a reason that I try to take the shortcuts. And so, you know, I think for new teachers, because it's so hard right now, and we know every state needs more teacher candidates, and it's just so hard thinking about, all right, what is sustainable? What I'm discovering is when I do a little bit of long-term planning, it's saving me on the day-to-day -day planning. It, it, it is. It's and, and it's cutting my grading time because I know what I'm going for. In the olden days, I used to have to justify a grade. And I would spend all this time kind of thinking about comments to write that weren't going to hurt people's feelings, but were reflective of their performance. And oh my goodness, that took me forever. But if I know where I'm going and I'm showing models and I'm really clear um, of what I want students to know and be able to do, that's saving me on the day-to-day -day basis, which is helping me you know, you know, I think this is like my 36th year of teaching, want to go back and get out of bed in the morning, right? Like, I, I want to be able to be excited to go to school and see the kids. Yeah, the rubric for me and the one, again, I think it's got to be, everyone has to figure it out for themselves is, is what I'm doing life giving or life sucking? Because mm -hmm. I'm with you, there are certain things where I can work hard. And at the end of it, they're usually related to collaboration or creativity. But at mm -hmm. the end, I feel like I have more energy than I did when I when I started. And then there are things often, they're clerical sorts of things where at the end, it's like, it, it feels like it took a lot more effort and energy than the time that I put into it. And so looking at my practice and trying to figure out where's, where is that? There are certainly some things that I have to do that are, are going to be life sucking. It's, it's just the nature of any job. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm fortunate that I have, have some choice. I mean, this podcast is a good example. This, you know, being able to talk to people, being able to, to think about talk my own way to understanding about things like planning and assessment and things like that. This is, these always end up at the end. I feel more energized than I do when I started. And uh, so we're, we're so grateful for that. So, so Chris, thank you for your time. You've been very, very gracious. And uh, I look forward to reading the new book and look forward to seeing what you do next. I'm glad to hear that you're still feeling energized because that means <laughs> more good stuff. I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. This is great. This is so much fun to think about teaching in Ted Lasso. What a, what a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Sonny, Sonny Bono was never known for his, you know, awesome <laughs> voice. So I'm, I'm sure I'll get letters that somebody who really <laughs> did like Sonny Bono. 